that you were able to join for expanding our roots. The purpose of this interview series is to give you an opportunity to tell your story and to show how Louisiana is a place of diversity and consciousness and a place of problem solvers and not just the problems to be solved. The interviews that I have done for the past couple of months have often involved a series of very complicated and complex and multi-layered questions. However, mm -hmm. I never start the interview with a multi-layered, super complicated <laughs> question. I hey. start with a very simple one. And that simple question is, where are you from? I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Although awesome. I, um, I lived for about nine years in Philadelphia or outside of Philadelphia, then in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, not Mississippi. And uh, then in 2010, moved on back. <laughs> I feel like we fast forwarded through time somewhere. And <laughs> one, I'm, yeah, because a lot of times Baton Rouge is known as a place that a lot of people stay mm -hmm. in for their whole lives, or it's yeah. a place that people grow up in and leave and never come back. And yeah. yet you are one of the very few people who left Baton Rouge, went uh -huh. somewhere else, and then came back home to Baton Rouge. So walk me through your journey of going from Baton Rouge to Philadelphia. Well, when I was in high school, I uh, started thinking about college and I knew that I wanted to be somewhere different, um, meet different people, see another way of living, another sort of, I mean, yeah, the United States has kind of a culture, but there's so many cultures within the United States and I just wanted to get out and be in a big city, be outside of the South and have that experience. So I went to Bryn Mawr College, which is right outside of Philadelphia. And when I graduated, I was not ready to come back. So I stayed in Philly and I got my teacher certificate. I started teaching uh, Spanish in Philadelphia. And then I moved into some nonprofit work up there. And sort of around 2009 and then 2010 uh, finally made the move. The economy was going through some trouble and I had visited home a couple times and I missed the warm weather. I hated the cold. <laughs> I missed the green, the greenery around all year long and I missed the good food. So <laughs> So I came back and it was a hard transition because, you know, I also, when I came back here, I missed the great public transportation. I missed the great arts and culture scene, the great restaurants from so many different cultures around the world. Like we have a little bit of that here, but not nearly as much um, variety or quantity as in Philadelphia. Also my, my now spouse, uh, then boyfriend was having trouble with finding work we saw that Baton Rouge had a lot of help wanted signs in the windows, whereas Philly was, he was just getting rejected job after job. So we thought, okay, let's make the move. I have had a chance to live in the mid-Atlantic when I was in college. And mm -hmm. what I find is that the mid-Atlantic is a very different place compared to the South. I mean, you're very right. Every part of America has its own unique culture. I mean, even within the South, each state has its own culture. What were some cultural differences that you noticed in Philadelphia compared to being in Baton Rouge in South Louisiana? For one thing, Philadelphia is much more, much more obviously culturally diverse. I feel like Baton Rouge is culturally diverse, but we don't see it. Um, one of the things about Philadelphia is people are, more people are using the sidewalks and public transportation. You just, you just see people from all over the city all the time, regardless of, you know, Philly is segregated racially in neighborhoods, but people move around on the same public transportation or they all come downtown and walk on the sidewalks when they've got to go, you know, somewhere, some common space downtown. So you see more people, you, you see more um, diversity of people, cultures, you hear more languages in the street, 
unlike Baton Rouge, where people tend to, yes, we have a bus system, but it's not that large. Um, doesn't have as many riders and doesn't run as frequently. So a lot of people are driving around in their cars. From your car, you go into a building, you're building to your car, to your house, and you don't run into that many more people outside of your work or the store that you go into or your small group of friends and family. So what I'm hearing is that Philadelphia has a lot more opportunities for people despite living in very segregated spaces to come together and co coexist with, with each other. Whereas mm -hmm. in Baton Rouge, because we have a more automobile driven culture in South Louisiana, people kind of go from one segregated space to the next and you don't yeah. really have a lot of time to interact with people. That's right. You can't accidentally run into somebody who's not in your segregated space like you do in Philadelphia. I mean, not to say that that's the goal, but, but yeah, you're right. You paraphrase it wonderfully. Segregation is a part of American cities, regardless of what region. But I mm -hmm. noticed that in many Northeastern, Mid-Atlantic and West Coast places, you see more diverse people because in many ways, there are many more opportunities to engage outside of your segregated spaces. So like you're saying, public mm -hmm. transportation. You know, in Baton Rouge and to a lesser extent in New Orleans, public transit is mostly restricted to lower income working class people. Whereas yeah. in New York, you'll find everybody from, from really poor people to really wealthy people who use the subway or use the bus yeah. or use a taxi. So you have yeah. more opportunities to mix and mingle with each other. Exactly. I've had people, so my husband is Mexican and friends have asked me, well, where's the Mexican community in Baton Rouge? I've never really seen them. And I'm like, well, you've never gone to the neighborhoods. Like you've never, you've never gone and looked for Mexican neighborhoods. You've never gone into the stores, you know, like there, yes, I, there, we do have a large diversity of people here in Baton Rouge, but like you said, people go from one segregated space to another without really mixing in common in common spaces. So there is sort of this ignorance of who's here and and where are they and what are people up to, you know? I'm going to be honest. I did not realize how diverse Baton Rouge was until I started the A2 Win Project and actually wow. sought out people from different backgrounds because mm -hmm. I was like, I want the diversity that I saw as a high school student reflected in my organization. However, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to do that in a very segregated city. Whereas if I were in New Houston or Atlanta or Philly or LA, you know, the work of 821 will probably be extremely easy because everybody yeah. is all in one place. I just have yeah. to go here, 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 and then ta-da, I got to, the work is done for me. Yeah, like in Philadelphia, pretty much every cultural group had their organization, like their nonprofit cultural organizations, and, or maybe not even just cultural, you know, civic organizations too. And then there were coalitions so, you know, like the Latin American coalition or the Latin American organization, and there were several, but the, the one that I was involved with was working with the Asian um, organization and the African American organization. And they um, were like forming coalitions, which was really amazing. And, you know, I haven't, well, I guess I haven't been that involved with it in Baton Rouge. So I don't know if that's happening, but I don't hear about it. I don't see those events happening. So it, it feels like in Philadelphia, there was more organization and coalition between the, the, the organizations than I see here. I don't see it as often, but I am optimistic that that will change. And I yeah. also know a lot of people in this community, myself included, who are working to create more of those coalition type, style spaces. Mm -hmm. Based on what I'm hearing, Philadelphia is a place that has a very different culture to South Louisiana, not necessarily yeah. in culture and, and how we think of it, like languages, food, things like that, but more so urban culture. Yeah. And so I wanted to know, since you said earlier that your transition was not easy being back in Baton Rouge, um, what were some challenges that you experienced moving back home after living in Philadelphia for so long? Boredom hit pretty big. <laughs> There's always something to do uh, in Philly. There's always somewhere to go. There's always people to meet up with. And um, Baton Rouge is much quieter. There's stuff to do, but it's 
from time to time. Um, I really miss the public transportation. Uh, it's very frustrating to drive on the roads here. You spend a lot of time in the car and it's, you know, stop and go and it's, um, and I'm not just hating on the traffic, but it's stressful and you're sitting for a long time and, you know, it would be so much easier to just take public transportation and, and sit and relax. And then when you get there, you're there. When I was in New England, I was very struck by how different the region was because it was less urban than Louisiana was. And it was mm -hmm. also a lot less diverse. However, yeah. one of the things that I missed about living in New England was how in a sense, even though it was such a small rural community, and it was not perfect either. I mean, I had, I experienced racism and things like that. New England mm -hmm. was a region that knew that it was so isolated from the world. So it was constantly seeking ways to reach out to the rest mm -hmm. of the world. So mm -hmm. one example of this is international education, the whole study abroad, student exchange, that whole tradition started in New England, because New England oh. is known as like this center of education in the world, mm -hmm. and where a lot of I mean, Harvard is in New England and international yeah. education, a lot of older international education organizations kind of started in the New England region. But when you go to Louisiana, we are ironically a very multicultural, globally connected state historically, but we mm -hmm. oftentimes are much more insular in terms of yeah. we only see outside of ourselves. So that's like one thing I missed yeah. about living in another part of the country. There seems to be, and not to say that this it doesn't exist in a place like Philadelphia, but there seems to be a lot of closed mindedness here. And it's, it's, a, that has a lot to do with why I wanted to leave um, when I was 18. And it's something that was another transition when I came back. People don't seem to even be interested in learning what the culture or life is like outside of Baton Rouge. <laughs> much less Louisiana or the United States. There's a lot of, our country is the best in everything and we are the best and everyone should be like us. And I don't know, you have to, I feel like you need to be honest and look at, first of all, look outside of your country, look outside of your state, look outside of your city and see what's happening, see what people are doing, and then look at it more objectively. It's very subjective to have no idea what's going on anywhere else and to just say, well, I'm the best. <laughs> We're the best. And you miss out on a lot. You know, that it's a very um, closed minded and it's, it's frankly ignorance. If you don't know what's happening, then you're making that claim based on lack of knowledge. That's ignorance. And um, not saying stupid, you know, somebody can be intelligent, but also not know what's up realize so, so many people don't have the um, privilege to travel outside of the country. That's not so easy to do, but you can easily find out other perspectives from other parts of the world without leaving your couch <laughs> and, um, or without leaving your city. And um, listening to other perspectives really helps you see your own self and your city, your state, your country, from a more objective lens. When you are able to travel, and I'm not trying to say that travel is the only way that you can experience another culture, but when you are able to travel, you have the opportunity to see with your eyes. I mean, that sounds so oxymoronic, but yes, you know, you get to see that there is a difference between where you're from and where you live and the rest of the world. It's not enough mm -hmm. to hear about it, but you actually get to see that it actually exists. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that I've observed is that when people who leave Baton Rouge go to other parts of the country or maybe even go abroad and come back, they have this new understanding of themselves and how mm -hmm. a community should be. And as a result, instead of trying to fit into old ways of doing and existing, living in their home community, they find other ways to get involved and other ways to navigate that space. So mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people who move back to Baton Rouge from other places oftentimes are very involved in community work, are very involved in activism, or are, are much more involved in other cultural spaces that they may not have been involved in prior to leaving. What are some things that you've been able to do 
being back in Baton Rouge since you've moved back from Philly? One thing that was heavily influenced by my having been in Philly, which is getting involved in the League of Women Voters. I hadn't heard of it before I left, but when I was, well, first of all, Bryn Mawr College is a women's college. So there's a lot of, uh, I learned a lot of things about um, just feminist work. And I learned so much more about what's being done uh, by organizations working for women's equality and things like that. So in Philly, when the, an election came up, I would go to the League of Women Voters website, and there's this other awesome group up there called Committee of 70, and they would have, uh, both organizations had voters guides where you could see, uh, you go to their website and they'd show each candidate that's up for election, and those candidates would have answered questions that those groups posed to them. And then you would just compare them and see who matches up best with your ideology. It's really hard to do on your own. There's, there can be so many candidates on a ballot and you could spend hours and hours researching them, just going to their websites and not just their websites because that doesn't give you a whole lot of information. Um, looking up their interviews that they may have done with the newspaper or you know, any kind of interviews they've done. It's a lot of research to find out what each candidate stands for. And then even then, you might be comparing them, their responses to very different issues. So these voter guides were awesome because they'd ask each candidate the same question. And then you just say, okay, I like their answer. I don't like their answer. I like theirs. And then, okay, well, I really like these two. Which one did I like the most? Or which one like fits with me better? And it was just the it's like one-stop shopping to figure out who you want to vote for. When I came back to Baton Rouge, the elections would come up and I'd be like, okay, where's the voters guy? <laughs> what? There's no committee of 70 here. What? Cause when I left, I was not really an adult. I had just become an adult. I had never voted before in Baton Rouge. The first election I could vote in, I was already in Philly. So when I came back to Louisiana, it was my first time living here as an adult. So I was learning a lot of things for the first time here. Um, so, okay, where's the committee of 70? Oh, there is none. Where's the League of Women Voters? Seven years here, doing a lot of research for myself every time an election came up. And I thought, man, when is somebody gonna make a voter's guide? And nobody would, nobody did. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna call the League of Women Voters in Louisiana, ask about um, a chapter in Baton Rouge and, uh, or a league, excuse me, in Baton Rouge and see if we can get a voter's guide here. And they're like, yeah, great. Who's gonna run it? I was like, I guess I will. <laughs> you know, nobody was stepping up. So, okay, I'm gonna do it. So that's something that I've been working on since 2018, every election. I reach out to the candidates, the rest of the women in the league, in our local league, uh, you know, help me reach out to them, um, come up with questions and edit the questions and um, help publicize it afterwards. So that's one, project that I've been working on since I got back, well, a few years after I got back, that I don't think would ever have happened if I hadn't seen how that works outside the city. So you talked about a voter guide that the League of Women Voters does. And interestingly enough, mm -hmm. one of our past interviewees works with a voting organization. It also creates a voter guide. Yes. Yes. Um, I saw Colleen Kissel's interview. In fact, I had been in touch with her when um, the first year they did a voter's guide was the first year we did a voter's guide. And we, League of Women Voters wasn't aware that they were working on that. And I think they probably weren't aware that we were working on one. So it was, when they came out, it felt like a surprise. And um, the next year we collaborated on trying to get our information about the voter's guide to the candidates. So we talked about, you know, how did you do it? How did you do it? Can we collaborate on that. So um, we didn't do that again this year. I think COVID kind of knocked everything out of whack and that just, it just, the connection wasn't made. But um, yeah, it was, I was glad to see that you had interviewed her too. This is amazing that Baton Rouge went from having zero voters guides to two in the same year. And now, you know, although it may frustrate the candidates, because they're like, what, another one? <laughs> but 
it's such a great resource for people in Baton Rouge who are trying to find out who are these candidates? What do they stand for? It helps people make an informed decision when you go to the ballot, because it's not just a bunch of names that you have no idea who these people are. You can easily find out by now two voter guides in Baton Rouge. And some of those voter guides may cover candidates that may not have been covered in the other voter guides. So it's almost like each one fills in the gaps of the other. So it's not mm-hmm. really a competition. It's more like a collaboration. Mm-hmm. Yes. When we do get a chance to collaborate, it's, it's literal a collaboration. And then, you know, even if we aren't working together on the voters guides, it's a, it's, you're right. It's a great resource. They complement each other. And they ask different questions. Well, we do have a very important election coming up. So those voter guides are going to be very, very important. But another thing that's going to be very important is getting people to vote. The next yeah. issue are dealing with people who don't vote, meaning they may not vote for ideological reasons. They may not vote mm-hmm. because of accessibility, especially with mm-hmm. the different laws that are being passed to make it harder to vote. Or the law or the vo- voting may be a just a lack of familiarity around voting. Like, oh, well, I don't know anyone who's done it, so maybe I shouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. So like, what are some challenges that you face in getting people to actually vote, let alone be an uninformed or informed voter? This is something that we've been talking about in our, in our league meetings, because we recently did, as you know, Jahi, because that's how we met, um, <laughs> we recently did a voter's registration drive at McKinley High School with the seniors there who were eligible to register and um, wound up registering 80 of them. And we were ready to come back the next week to get the rest and school shut down because of COVID-19. So unfortunately we didn't get to do that, Um, but hopefully seeing that, you know, friends or classmates got registered, hopefully encouraged others to do it too. But Part of that process was also working with the students there. We worked with students in Humanities Amped, which is such an amazing program um, at McKinley and four other high schools, which you know about. And those students took the lead um, on not just helping students register to vote, but talking about and having a discussion on why students and adults, you know, just anybody may have strong feelings against it. And although I don't have those feelings, their feelings are valid. But I think what we need to do is have a conversation. If you know somebody who says, I don't vote or what's the point, have an open conversation with them about it because yeah, they, their feelings are valid. They're, they're, they may have what feels like very good reasons not to, but maybe they would see it from another perspective uh, if they had a conversation about it. Because ultimately, we live in a place where we get to elect who we want to make the rules. So if we don't like the rules, we elect people who are going to change those rules. That's how I explain it to my kids. I don't say laws. I don't know what a law is. My kids are three and six. So I say, there's people in charge who make the rules. And and when we have elections, people are, people are asking to be in charge. So we get to say if they get to be in charge or not. So that's what voting is. Um, that's how I explain it to my little ones. So we can have new rules. We can have better rules. But to do that, we have to go out and, and choose the people we want to make the rules or run ourselves. If nobody else is doing it the way we think it needs to be done, the more people participating, the better. We have unfortunately such low voter turnout, especially in non-presidential elections, and such a very small percentage of Baton Rougeans are voting for who they want to be in charge, who's gonna be on the Metro Council, who's gonna be on the school board. You know, maybe more are gonna turn out for the mayor's race, but for other positions that people don't seem to view as being as, as big or as important, you know, those are the people who make policy. If we can have those conversations and talk about how, well, the people who are making policies are not making good policies. All we have to do is show up and bring our friends and bring our family and vote them out and vote in the people we want. 
we can really make change. The perfect an analogy I have for voting's importance is actually something that is not connected to voting. So mm -hmm. I use the analogy of going to Applebee's. So like, for example, if you go to Applebee's and you have a really bad experience with Applebee's, then you're not going to want to get rid of the CEO of Applebee's because the mm -hmm. CEO doesn't have a lot of power over this one restaurant that you went yeah. to and had a bad experience. But the manager has power. And yeah. I think that that analogy I use is to describe that voting, it shouldn't be just about the people at the top. It's mm -hmm. also about the people who are not at the top, but still have an impact on your lives. Because we oftentimes think of the president and, the, and maybe a senator, depending on where you live, but we don't realize that local politics are just, just as important as federal politics. And yeah. sometimes the mayor and the city council members and the state reps and the governors may have more power over your lives than the federal yeah. officials that we elect. I mean, to continue the analogy for Applebee's, I mean, if you have a bad experience at a restaurant, then replacing the CEO probably is not going to do as much good compared to replacing the manager or replacing the, the, the waiter or waitress who served you. If you mm -hmm. go to a hotel, if you go to a hotel and you have a bad experience with your room, then probably replacing the CEO of that hotel corporation is not going to have as much of an impact on you as much mm -hmm. as, you know, replacing the manager of the hotel who can be responsible for housekeeping and all these other things she may have had issues with. Absolutely. I love that analogy. We need to have those conversations using that analogy with everyone we know. And everyone yeah, we but, don't know. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people don't vote because they think that ironically, they don't understand how much more mileage voting can get you. Because oftentimes mm -hmm. they think, oh, well, I'm going to vote for president. But if the president doesn't align with their beliefs exactly, then there's always this conflict of, well, I don't, I don't want to vote for this person because it's not going to make much of a difference. Not mm -hmm. realizing that your vote may make a difference for the mayor's race or the city council yeah. race or yeah. the state rep, even Congress, a member of Congress. I mean, regardless of what side of the aisle you may be on, you probably have a big difference in your experience with your legislature if you replace a legislator who is unwilling to listen to you with one who is. Absolutely. And you can feel your, so there's so much more you can do with voting. Not to mention that so many people worked so hard to secure the right to vote for more and more people. Mm -hmm. At the time of this interview, we have officially reached 100 years since women were officially granted, well, specifically yes. white women were granted the right to right. vote. Right. On paper, all women. In practice, white women. Right. So like, but that was 100 years ago. And I know yeah. there are people in, on this earth right now who are probably the same age as wow. the yeah. time that, that women have had the right to vote on paper. That's true. Yes, that's true. I had things I wanted to say about that, but man, <laughs> you just hit me with the gravity of that. It's so we take it for granted and maybe that sounds cliche but we do we we even even as a woman i was looking at this exhibit that's up at the uh the manship or the the shaw center the manship theater like the second floor where they do exhibits there's one right now on 100 years of women's suffrage and it's a really neat exhibit uh recommend checking it out there's such a long way we still have to go to get women's equality. For example, our pay is still lower. And then as you, as you break that down by race, it's, it gets even lower. We still have a long ways to go. And I was looking at this exhibit and in the 70s, in the 70s is when women could finally own, have credit cards in their name if they were married, if they were married, they had to be in their husband's name. They could not have their own credit account. And it wasn't until the seventies that women got that. I don't think about that. It, when I, had, I had heard it before, but I forgot. And I saw it again at this exhibit and I was like, wow, that was right before I was born. That was my mom. My mom was a married woman in the seventies and that affected her. And but, you know, that's a credit card. Going back to the right to vote, which is huge, because 
people are making laws about you and you can't vote for these people who are making laws, having the right to vote is such a, I'm not going to call it a privilege. It's a right. It's a right that everyone should have, but didn't. And still some don't. And maybe that has, I don't know if that has led to some of the ambivalence about it. Um, you know, these people in charge never cared about us. So why should we even try? But I don't know. I see it another way. I see it as we finally have our right. And if we exercise it, we can actually make the change when the more people who go out and make their voice heard at the ballot box, the, the more our government is going to represent all of us because it's only representing some of us right now. And I think that that is a nonpartisan statement that doesn't necessarily endorse anybody. I think Mm -hmm. government should represent everybody and especially those who have spent so much of their time feeling under and unrepresented. And I actually just looked up the definition of privilege and the definition is a special right advantage or immunity granted or or available only to a particular person or group or Mm -hmm. something regarded as a special honor. So voting is something that is key to democracy. So it shouldn't be considered a special advantage to do something that sustains democracy. That's like considering Mm -hmm. taking the garbage out of privilege to maintain a clean home. You know, (laughs) that's how I, that's how I see it. You know, when Uh you vote, you make sure that this democracy stays. And yeah. if, you, if you see voting as a privilege, then you only see voting in this, this perspective of, well, some people should get it, but not everybody should get it. And mm-hmm. I don't think that that's fair to say because if we only have the right to vote being granted to a very specific portion of the population in this country, we aren't a democracy. Right. Democracy means everybody participates. And mm-hmm. we can fight all this kind of stuff because our certain politicians or people don't represent our political beliefs. But the whole purpose of democracy is being able to kiss on the cheek and make up and find a way to reconcile those differences while also staying true to ourselves. But if we mm-hmm. are in a position where only one party has, has power or only one part of the population has the power to decide what happens for the rest of the population, then mm-hmm. we are not a democracy. So voting is a duty, not a privilege, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Yep, right and responsibility. In some countries, you have to vote. In the United States, I mean, I'm not saying we should have to vote, but I think we need to go a lot further in, people can vote as soon as they turn 18, and people turn 18 often in high school. And I never got a high school class or a high school lesson on here's why voting is important, or there might have been, but it was forgettable. Uh, There was nothing about the real effect of voting. Here's what a ballot looks like. Here's how you find out who's going to be on the ballot, and this is what the voting machine looks like. I mean, I'm sure it varies place by place, but high school's local. Probably you're going to be voting in that area. Um, Here's how to register. Here, get registered if you want. If you don't and you want to do it on your own, here's how to do it. Here's, you know, just all the rules. I had to learn all this on my own or the League of Women Voters helped me a lot uh, to find out what's going on. The Secretary of State website for Louisiana or the GoVote app, which are pretty much the same thing, has a lot of information. The voter portal for the Secretary of State has all kinds of information that you could possibly want. Where do you need to vote? Um, Are you registered? How to register if you're not? How to change your name on your registration? Because if you've changed your address or your name, you need to change your voter registration and you need to do it by a certain date before the election. You can't just show up and, and say, oh, you know, my information has changed, it's too late. You have to do it ahead of time. So the GoVote app or GoVote.com Um, which will take you to the voter portal for Secretary of State of Louisiana. One of the final questions I wanted to ask you was connected to this idea of collaboration. We cannot Mm -hmm. do the work that we do in this community, locally, nationally, or globally, without collaborating. 
And voter education is something that you stress wasn't accessible to you until you were an adult and you were mm -hmm. out of high school. So what mm -hmm. are some collaborations that you would like to see, if you can answer this question, that would allow for voter education to be more accessible to people that would probably take the burden off of organizations like the League of Women Voters and Vote BR and so many other voting rights, voter education organizations here in, in Baton Rouge? Ideally, voter education should happen in school. And it should be a part of the curriculum. Until it is, League of Women Voters is going to keep going into the high schools and talking to the kids about students, young people, excuse me, <laughs> about um, voting, registering, having that discussion. You know, some are going to say, no, why should I do it? And we're not going to say, well, you have to, you're wrong. But having that open conversation about, well, why do you think what you think? And let me tell you what I, why I think what I think. But also that simple explanations of how to find things out and how to do it, how to vote, where to go, how to find out that there's even an election coming up, which by the way, <laughs> you can go to the League of Women Voters um, Baton Rouge League website and sign up for election reminders. FYI, I had to put that plug in. But ideally, this would be, you know, PSA, this would be happening in the high schools, voter education, uh, when the election's coming up, I know the paper, I know the, the Advocate, which is our main paper here, uh, often runs a lot of information about upcoming elections, but I think it needs to be in a lot more places than just that venue or just that medium. So it would be great if people got so excited, like people get so excited before a football game here. What if people got so excited before an election, <laughs> you know, and some people do. Some people have the yard signs and it's great. But so many people are just kind of ambivalent about it. And ideally, we would have a community that was much more involved in our democracy and much more excited about participating in it. That's what I would like to see. I think that we need to have a lot more voter education happening in schools or just everywhere we can. So I think that the best way that the community can support organizations like, your, like yours are just offering you spaces to talk to and educate people. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I'm also thinking about is just this, the role of young people in democracy as well, because mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I'm kind of still considered young, so I guess I fall into this category as well. But one of the things that I observed is that young people are the ones who shape the future of cities and the future of communities. And mm -hmm. the things that you thought about as far as Baton Rouge is concerned, as a young person in high school, unfortunately, are not necessarily thoughts that were common, that were only specific to your generation. Mm -hmm. I was someone who felt that way. There are people mm -hmm. that are younger than me who feel this way. It seems like there's a trend. And I talked about this with somebody else. You know, There's a trend of people who grow up in Louisiana who do not see their community as something worth investing in, especially people who come yeah. from marginalized backgrounds. So what do you feel needs to happen for young people to feel as though Baton Rouge is a place that they can invest in and, you know, be embraced by and not have to go to a Houston or a Philadelphia or New York or an LA or Chicago or an Atlanta to, to find their space? There's so much energy. There's so many great ideas that the youth have and, and then take somewhere else. <laughs> when I was a young person, I, and I had ideas and I wanted to be in a different place where I felt like I could learn more about what I wanted to learn. I, I, I left because I felt like there wasn't a space for me to do what I wanted to do or to learn what I wanted to learn in Louisiana. Because, I, you know, as an 18 year old, some, some young people have amazing knowledge and ambition and they make things happen right away. Others like myself, I needed guidance and I didn't have that guidance here. Or if there was that guidance here, I hadn't been plugged into it. I wasn't connected to it. So I think something that we can do as older folks, <laughs> I don't know if I'm in that category, but as adults who are in these organizations or who are working on these projects, we need to reach out more to young people, not just as 
um, let me let me tell you how you need to do it or come join what we're doing, but don't really have a say in it because you're too young to know anything. We need to, we need to trust that they have good ideas. And um, like you said, they're, maybe it sounds cliche to say they're the future, but it's so true. They're, they have a vision for what's going to happen in the future and they're the ones who are going to make it happen. Um, coming up behind us. So we need to involve them in what we're doing, but also let them have some leadership roles, um, respect their, their roles and their ideas um, and their opinions, the projects that they want to make happen, give them the space for that. I feel as though encouragement seems a bit trivial as far as something that can kind of keep young people in Louisiana or just in Baton Rouge specifically, but I also feel as though that is very integral because oftentimes a lot of people have these cool, amazing ideas, but in a place like Baton Rouge, there's often this, this, Oh, it's not going to work here. People like Mm -hmm. here don't really care about that stuff. Oh, Mm -hmm. you're better off going to another part of the country or world to do this. And guess what? They do. People go young and old. They try something in Baton Rouge. It doesn't work. So they take it to Houston. They take it to Dallas. Yeah. They take it to LA, to the Seattle, to any other major city that has more than 500,000 people and do it and they flourish. And yeah. many, in many ways, <laughs> it leads to a negative feedback cycle because you have people, all the, there's a brain drain. And then mm-hmm. also the people that are here are people who are completely satisfied with the community in a sense yes. of, yes. you know, satisfied this, oh, well, things are working here. Things are fine. So there's nothing that we can do to improve it. Or, it perpetuates itself. Right. And you have the people here that are like, well, I mean, it sucks here, but I can't do anything about it. I'm just going to keep my head yeah. low and make it happen. And yeah. then you have the people who are actively doing nothing. So it's one thing to do something that people don't agree with or to, you know, have a political disagreement and come meet Mm -hmm. in the middle. It's another thing to have people perceive government or just institutions of power or just leadership, community, political, any part of kind of leadership as working against them and not Mm -hmm. moving forward. And so I think that if more people were encouraged to invest in their communities and had support more than just, oh, that's awesome, more so like financial support, um, yes. mentorship, things like yeah. that, then you'll have more younger people investing in Baton Rouge and also investing in themselves because yes. we don't live in this world by ourselves. We all coexist and are connected to one another and we have to mm-hmm. embrace that connectivity. It can't mm-hmm. just be up to people individually to uplift themselves when it is a community that uplifts everyone else successfully. Exactly. <laughs> I have nothing to add to that, Jackie. You just <laughs> you summed it up. I I appreciate that, but I <laughs> but that's just those are just my thoughts. I mean, I usually don't mm-hmm. get to talk about my thoughts on an interview, but that's those are my honest thoughts. I think that if more people invested and were encouraged to invest and were mm-hmm. encouraged to encourage others to invest, yes. then this yes. community will be a lot different. I'm not trying to say we need to make Baton Rouge a Philadelphia or a Houston or Atlanta or right. New York, but we need to nurture the creativeness of Baton Rouge, the diversity of Baton Rouge, the innovativeness, if that's even a word. Is that a word? It can be. Okay. It's I don't know. A word today. Let's, <laughs> I, I, I understood it without... I didn't even question it until you did. So. Okay. okay. Well, the innovation, the innovation of Baton Rouge, nurturing all these different things, mm-hmm. and that will help grow the city. Because if it's kind of like the saying, you know, you have to, you can't love others until you love yourself. Mm-hmm. And even though I have my own disagreements with that whole phrase, there is a little bit of truth in that. In mm-hmm. order for us to be loved to be loved by others in Baton Rouge or outside of the state. And also for us to be nurturing to other people, we have to love ourselves. And that means Mm -hmm. investing our community in ways that bring out the best in us, bring Mm -hmm. out the richness in us, bring out the kaleidoscope of cultures that exist within this community Mm -hmm. and nurturing that. So that way other people can see us nurturing and loving on ourselves and want to be a part of that as well. And you're doing that. And I'm, I love that. 
<laughs> I thank you. I appreciate that. I have one last question. This is my final question. I yeah. always ask this question because I know earlier you said that you wanted to say something, but then you felt like you forgot it. And I know that when it comes to an interview, whether it's a job mm -hmm. interview, whether it's a interview for a magazine or whatever, we mm -hmm. always have this thought of, man, I wish I said this, man, I wish I said that. Yeah. I don't want you to feel that way. What are some final thoughts that you wanted to express that you hadn't had a chance to express or may have kind of had it pop up in your head during the course of this interview that you wanted to express now? Hmm. I feel like I made all the plugs that I wanted to make, <laughs> but I'll, I'll reiterate. I would love to see people more engaged in our politics. And a part of that is knowing what's happening. And if you want to have an easy way of knowing what's happening, sign up for League of Women Voters election um, of Baton Rouge election reminders. And you can also sign up for the newsletter and find out the newsletter is only quarterly. You're not going to be inundated with emails every week. And you're like, ah, it's unsubscribe. Um, <laughs> we'll tell you what's going on. We'll tell you ways that you can get involved. But especially if nothing else, sign up for the election reminders. You'll never miss one. You'll always get a voter's guide in the email that um, by email that helps you know who the candidates are. So you're never, ever going to the ballot box and you don't know what one of the names are. You know, you see a name and you're like, who's that? I'm not even sure. So I'm not going to vote for them. That's you could be skipping out on a gem. You know, this could be the person who, who you would love to run, but you just hadn't heard their name yet because it wasn't advertised on TV or in the newspaper. So armed, please, before you go, know exactly who's going to be on your ballot, what the questions are, and what they all mean, um, and what these people stand for. And the easiest way to do that is to just sign up for our election reminders. <laughs> So um, that website is www.lwvofla.org forward slash Baton Rouge. So check it out, sign up, be informed, and vote. Voting is an evergreen thought. Vote, vote, yes. vote. And even if you feel like voting isn't enough for you, there's many of a way to get involved, but voting is very important. Yes. Melissa, I thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and sharing your perspectives with, with me and talking about your journey and your work. I hope that more people can watch this and realize that they need to get their butts to the polls and also <laughs> encourage other people to vote. And if there's someone mm -hmm. who is not really into voting or is against voting, they need to at least okay. find a way to be involved in their community and make a difference. Because if you're not voting, at least do something to help make the community you live in better. Exactly. There's something we all could do. Yes. And even if we're doing it, I feel like we can always do more. Thank you so much, Melissa. It was a pleasure talking to you. And I hope that this was Thank an you, opportunity Jenny. that you felt you could use to tell your story and share your experiences and feel heard. I really appreciate the opportunity and um, I really enjoyed our talk.